Hey, aloha and welcome to another exciting Friday afternoon with Stan Energy Man here. Stan Osterman used to be with HCAT, now I'm just retired and loving every minute of it. Every day is a Saturday. Speaking of retired, uh, I had a retirement function on Wednesday evening and it was great. I would like to thank everybody at HCAT that uh, put it together and everybody that attended. We had folks from the congressional offices, folks from the state capitol, folks from the private sector, folks from... Uh, non-for-profits, uh, state energy office was there, all of HCAT was there, all of, a bunch of HTDC was there. It was a great time. So thanks to everyone for being there and uh, helping me celebrate uh, six years with the state and HCAT. Today's a kind of a different show, aside from being a solo show for me. Um, I, I'm going to be starting uh, next week on Tuesday. My show will be on Tuesday instead of Friday. So uh, don't wait for Friday to look for me. I'm going to be on Tuesday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. But it's also Friday the 13th, which is always exciting. And we've had some recent events that uh, have come to light that have gotten my attention. And I, I've talked about energy and the weather on several shows before. And, you know, it's really kind of appropriate that we really get serious about it. It is hurricane season right now. And with Hurricane Dorian that just smacked uh, Jamaica really, really hard, um, I started thinking about our local um, scenarios and, and what, whether we're really ready, especially on Oahu, for the kind of weather that they just got hit with uh, in Jamaica. And um, to give you a little background on me, I, do, I have 35 years in the Hawaii Air National Guard. I'm also a former police officer. And uh, in the National Guard, uh, we have to know how, besides doing our Air Force jobs, we have to be able to do uh, military support to civil authorities and disaster response. And we actually have some fairly formal uh, education conducted by the, uh, the folks at FEMA and also uh, other agencies, um, including some National Guard contract agencies that, that help us prepare our states uh, and plan for natural disasters and how to interface with other agencies, including uh, non-governmental agencies and state agencies and local police and uh, civil defense agencies. So I do have the background. And some of the background training I've had has had some really great um, firsthand experience uh, from some great uh, planners. And planning is the key. Planning is the first step in getting ready for a natural disaster. But I have to tell you, uh, it's, it's almost ironic that in my formal training, two of the planners that came to brief our class, one was from New Orleans and one was from New York City. And this is before 9-11 and before the hurricanes hit the Gulf Coast that really spanked New Orleans uh, badly. I forget which hurricane it was, but the interesting thing was that New Orleans had an awesome plan. I mean, it was incredible. They had buses moving uh, non-ambulatory patients and, and elderly people, moving them to safe grounds, because New Orleans is basically lower than sea level, so they have a, a very sophisticated dike and, um, and uh, system there to, to keep the water out of the city. And so when you have a hurricane coming in, it's really important that you have good planning. I was really impressed with both plans that were presented. Interestingly enough, though, they couldn't be executed. As beautiful as the plans were, the city of New Orleans was not ready to execute the plan that they had. And to give you an example, you know, the buses that were supposed to be there to move uh, people who are you know, non-ambulatory from mental hospitals, from hospitals, uh, elderly folks from, from care homes, the buses weren't fueled, and the buses weren't there, and the drivers weren't aware of where to go to get their buses. And, you know, all the details behind the plans that need to be there, all the practice that needs to be there, it was all missing. That's really a scary thought. By contrast, New York City had a hurricane plan, and they briefed it. And it was really kind of interesting because they weren't hit by a hurricane. They were hit by a terrorist attack. But certainly the plans that they had uh, they fit, they work, and the agencies were able to function together and work together in spite of the, the totally unexpected, totally uh, off-the-wall attack that was rendered by civilian airplanes being flown into high-rise buildings. So with Dorian behind us now, and, you know, that kind of destruction evident, and a couple of years ago, Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands being hit, uh, Oahu narrowly missed a, uh, a big hurricane with Hurricane Lane last year. And Hawaii has had several hurricanes and, and even some tsunamis uh, in my lifetime. I've lived here 65 years. 
And, you know, we, we've had some, some disasters come through. Most of them have really hit Kauai. Hurricane Iniki and Hurricane Eva pretty much spanked the island of Kauai. And uh, we've had some earthquakes and some lava flows and, and other things happen on the big island. But when you really think about it, in the last half century, we haven't had anything seriously major hit downtown Honolulu and the island of Oahu. Now, to give you an idea of how energy connects with all this, I want you to think about, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really big into this. I, I like to put a practical side to everything that, that we talk about here on the show, and it's an energy show. So I just want you to think for, for an instance. I want you to... Imagine going and getting two five-gallon buckets and filling them up with five gallons of water and then walking over and picking up both of them at the same time so you don't hurt yourself, picking up the two five-gallon buckets of water and feeling how heavy they are. And that's only 10 gallons of water. Well, I did some math this morning, and I'm not a math major, but I'll, I'll give you my formula too so you can check it yourself. If one inch of rain fell on one square mile of land, that would be 17,396,121 gallons of, of water on one square mile, one inch deep. Now a hurricane, a hurricane dumps hundreds of square miles and hundreds of inches of rain. Can you imagine how much energy it takes if you're standing there holding those two five gallon buckets, how much energy it takes, literal, physical, Eat energy to get 17.4 million gallons of water up two or three miles in the sky as rain, to come down as rain. That's an incredible amount of energy, and we're not even talking about the wind power and things like that that come with a hurricane. Or if you're thinking in terms of a tsunami, a huge wave that moves across the ocean at 400 miles an hour and picks up millions of gallons of water and throws it on the shoreline. Can you imagine the energy there? And can you imagine the destruction that comes with that energy? Well, the formula I used for that was uh, 144 cubic uh, inches times 0 0.0043 gives you 0.624 gallons per square foot if it's only one inch thick. So if you do that math, it comes out to 27,878,400 gallons. And and when you figure how many, um, how many gallons is that over, uh, over that square mile, that's where the, the 27,878 comes from. So Hawaii's had the two major hurricanes in my lifetime. And the most serious storms have just been the hurricanes. And we've had a couple small tsunamis. But Oahu has really been dodging the bullet for a long, time, long, long time. And we have plans. I know the National Guard has some plans. They, they could be better. They could be more fleshed out. But I can guarantee you, as a state overall, we're really not ready. So let me give you just a glimpse of the scenarios. I'm just going to give you two. The two most likely and the two probably most deadly. Scenario one is a tsunami. First of all, if there's a major earthquake in Alaska, in California, in Chile, uh, in northern South America, in the South Pacific, it could generate a tsunami that can impact Hawaii. And what would happen if it impacts the south coastline? Well, first of all, a tsunami, no matter where it's coming from, has what we call a wraparound effect. So those waves and the impact of the tsunami is going to happen not just on a coastline that's directly facing where the, the threat was or where the, the, the uh, earthquake was. It can come and wrap around the islands. The most damaging effect will be probably that straight line. But just think, if we had a South America or Southern Hemisphere uh, earthquake and a shifting of the ocean floor that caused a tsunami, Waikiki and downtown Honolulu would be hit. That's our most dense population area. Lots of high rises, lots of people living there. All the coastal areas will take a hit. But guess what? Our main harbor that our containers all come in on, that's all in, on the southern shore. Our airport. Our main airport, which is only a couple feet above sea level. In fact, most people don't realize that there's, there are waterways that lead in from the ocean that go under our runways and taxiways at the Honolulu International Airport and come up near Nimitz Highway, which is a good mile and a half away from the ocean. That water's going to come up through those uh, underground um, conduits and come up and start flooding. 
Our wastewater treatment facilities, we have some major ones along the coastline. Our power generation is mostly on the coastline. Our, our turbine generators that run on oil, which is mostly the, the most uh, prevalent power we have, is on the Waianae Coast and in Pearl City, right next to Pearl Harbor. Both of them only a few feet above sea level. For a tsunami, a lot of the roadways that we have, especially on the North Shore, the East Shore, that run along the coastline, they're going to be underwater. A lot of residential area on the windward side is going to be hit by the tsunami. So it's kind of a bad scenario. But scenario number two is even worse because with a hurricane, you're going to get a lot of those same effects, especially along the coastline. But with a Cat 2 or higher hurricane, you're going to get all that damage plus wind damage and flooding to the interior areas well inside away from the ocean. And those things will cause landslides, mudslides, and down power lines that go across the mountains carrying power to the whole island. So what are the implications of all this? The implications are not only power out for a couple days or a couple hours, there will be power out for weeks or longer. There'll be limited drinking water, there'll be limited wastewater, and there'll be limited refuse handling. There'll be at least a week, I estimate, without hardly any assistance from the outside world because we're 2,500 miles away from any state. If you notice during hurricane, um, uh, the latest hurricane in the south and all the hurricanes, they're, they're states in the south and the southeast have uh, mutual support compacts between the states where they allow law enforcement and National Guard and um, utility agencies to cross state lines with their equipment and guarantee they'll pay for the help if they have to come in and help in a disaster. We don't have any states next to us. We don't have anybody. And like I said, those, those airports and those harbors that bring in all our major supplies, they're all right near, near the South Shore and they're at sea level. They may, they may be shut down for weeks. And even the airports, to get equipment down to clean them off, is going to take time because the roads are going to be damaged and closed and we only pre-position so much stuff. Outside of all of that, we're going to have limited fuel for emergency power generation. And that means fuel for hospitals, fuels for pumping water and, and taking care of sewage if those plants, for those plants that aren't damaged badly. We're going to have limited public service and limited security. Our police, our natural, National Guard, our Sheriff's Department, um, and even just our state agencies that are written into our plans to help support all those other public service agencies are going to be stressed to the max. And a lot of the people that are supposed to be supporting are going to be victims themselves. In addition, like I mentioned, on the South Shore especially, we have a lot of folks in high-rise apartments. And if you don't think about it, high-rise apartments, after a couple days, the water reserves they have up on the roof are gone. So therefore, there is no water in your high-rise apartment. There is no toilet operating in your high-rise apartment. You're getting, elevators are not going to be working. So you're going to have to bring up all your water, all your food, everything you need to your apartment from ground level if you can get it. Because guess what? If the stores are all shut down and guaranteed, even though we feel like we're civilized, there's going to be looting, there's going to be unrest, there's going to be people that are absolutely panicking because they weren't prepared, they don't have food. There's going to be limited communications, there's going to be serious public health issues. So we really have to think about the implications of what we potentially are facing, not if we're facing them, but when we face them. We're going to take a quick break here. I'll be back in 60 seconds, and we're going to talk about how energy dependent we really are. Aloha, my name is Victoria, and I'm a host at the Adventures in Small Business. This is a collaboration between U.S. Small Business Administration, Hawaii District Office, and its partners, where we showcase the stories of local entrepreneurs and small businesses, talk about how to start a business, talk about great tips for small business owners, uh, please join us every Thursday, 11 a.m. at Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, see you soon. Mahalo. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we we're fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my book, which is also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence achieving and sustaining success, and finding greatness. If you're a student, parent, sports or business person, and want to improve your life 
and the lives of people around you. Tune in and join me on Mondays at 11 a.m. as we go beyond the lines on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Hey, welcome back to Stand the Energy Man on Scary Aloha Friday, which also is Friday the 13th, and, and we're talking disasters in honor of Friday the 13th. We finished up by talking about how energy dependent we are. I, I had a guest on earlier this year named uh, Professor um, Nate Hoggins, and he introduced me to the concept called of energy blindness. And that's really kind of the focus of us not realizing how energy dependent we actually are. Most people can tell you how much their electric bill is, but they can't tell you how many kilowatt hours they use per day in their house. And that's because most of the time, we really don't pay attention to how much energy we use for anything. Our cars are like 200 horsepower plus. I mean, some are really heavy duty, but 200 horsepower. I mean, I have 200 horses worth of energy just to get me from Kailua to town and do 45 or 50 miles an hour. I mean, that's a lot of energy that we take advantage of, but we really don't appreciate. Well, there's a lot of energy in storms, and we really are energy dependent in ways you probably didn't think about. Um, I really feel sorry for folks that live in high rises if we have a major uh, incident here in Honolulu. But even the folks who don't live in, in downtown, they may have invested in solar on their house, and they have great solar photovoltaic cells on their house. If you don't have a battery system that's capable of helping you, the, uh, and give you the, giving you the ability to disconnect from the grid, you won't have any power either. So that great investment you put on your roof, all the solar panels, and you think, well, and everybody else doesn't have electricity, I'll have it. Well, if you're interconnected to the grid, Hawaiian Electric will make sure that you don't come back on the grid. They control it, and they, that's part of the, the contract you signed with them because they can't afford to have energized lines from people's houses well, they have people trying to refurbish their grid and reconnect everything. So unless your, your EV is made to disconnect from the grid, and unless you have energy storage on your side to help the grid, uh, help your PV get uh, activated and come up and provide power and recharge itself, you're really not as independent as you think. So in all disasters, not every area of the island, for example, is severely impacted. Even in a tsunami, you have a tsunami, yet the coastlines are gonna be devastated. But inland, there's actually a, a lot of areas that won't be impacted, that the roads will be fine, um, and everything should be pretty much normal, except that all the shipping and stuff that comes through the ports and the airports is gonna to be tough for a while. But really, there's no reason why we shouldn't be more energy independent. We have plenty of solar, we have wind, we have geothermal, we have ocean thermal. We have um, so many, we, have, we, can, we can actually gasify our, our rubbish and make some power that way. We have many ways that we can make enough energy. In fact, if we could tap into geothermal, geothermal is available on Oahu, on Maui, and on the Big Island relatively easily. We should be able to get good, solid, baseload power uh, even during a disaster. But more importantly, our grid is not set up to be divided into little subgrids. And what we really need to do is look at our infrastructure and have HECO or somebody decide how much each community can handle on its own with its own solar and start designing what we call microgrids. Now, microgrids are great because they can take care of themselves when they need to if they're isolating themselves from an outage or a big disaster. That way, if the folks down on the coastline have been inundated, have been pounded, have been um, you know, taken offline, um, we can have part of our community that can actually make ice and maybe even make fuel. Like if we have hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, we can charge batteries and we can make hydrogen for vehicles that can help clear the roads, clear the runways, fix up the ports to help us be able to accept the FEMA re uh, responses and the aid that we need to get when it comes in and when we're, our limited supplies are running low. We should be much more sustainable, but that sustainability means we have to start doing it now. We can't wait for the disaster to be on our doorstep. We need to start doing it now. We can't wait till 2045 when somebody decides that's when we need to finally come off the fossil fuels or our grid. We need to actually start 
taking our grid, sectoring it out, making sure we have a reasonable um, chunk of the island that can, can take care of itself, and then have the software and the computers that can interconnect the grid and leave it connected and operating, but be able to isolate itself into microgrids for survivability and resiliency. The definition of resiliency being that if you're hit by some unexpected event, you can come back and bounce back. And it's, if you're really resilient, you can actually bounce back stronger than before the disaster. And that should be Hawaii's goals, not just to be resilient to the point where we can sustain ourselves and recover, but to bounce back even stronger. And that's what our state is really good at. And we should, pre we should really try to, to make that our main goal and start working for it now before disaster is pending. So we need to network our grid for survivability and resiliency. And we need to be able to fuel our own electric fleets and not have to wait for gas or diesel to be refined in our refinery, which is also on the South Shore, by the way, or to arrive on a ship. And we need to develop large scale energy storage with my, in my per personal opinion, using hydrogen and batteries, and be able to fuel our own vehicles and operate our own machinery without the need for fossil fuels. So in conclusion, planning isn't everything, but not planning is criminal. We can't keep kicking the can down the road, and it may seem like the only option in today's curtailed and constrained envir budget environments, but it will be nothing compared to the loss of life and the suffering if we do not prepare for disasters now. We know we're only waiting for them to happen. It's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. What I'd like to do now is show you a quick video um, that I've shown before, but I'd like to show it again to drive the point home. Microgrids are a great way to help Hawaii become resilient and survivable. And this is a good example of how, what it looks like. There are over 300 million people in our country, and the vast majority rely on large-scale, centralized power grids for their energy. But the infrastructure is aging, and it is vulnerable. Natural disasters, cyber attacks, and other threats can leave large swaths of the country without power. Fortunately, there is an alternative. A renewable energy microgrid represents a different path for the future. Renewable microgrids generate power from sources like solar, wind, hydrogen, waste to energy, and geothermal. That power can be stored within the localized system using technologies such as advanced batteries, hydrogen, flywheels, pumped hydro, and others. These microgrids can provide reliable and efficient energy transmission, especially to critical facilities like hospitals, airports, and military bases. Unlike our current large-scale systems, Microgrids eliminate single points of failure and are therefore more resilient to disasters, threats, and power outages. Our current energy infrastructure loses a lot of money. Grid outages cost up to $33 billion annually. They are expensive to build, expand, and maintain. And they're inefficient, losing more than half of the initial energy to factors such as line loss, spending reserves, and theft. Microgrids solve these issues and greatly reduce transmission loss and maximize efficiency. They also reduce carbon emissions and eliminate imported fuel costs, keeping money within our local economy, and even create new local industries and jobs based on clean, renewable energy. Our energy grid was built over 100 years ago, when energy needs were simple, with the increased complexities of energy demands, power sources, and transportation. Now our old grids struggle to keep up we require new ways to generate, store, and deliver energy. Renewable energy microgrids are a potential long-term solution that will provide safe, clean, reliable, and efficient energy for generations to come. So that was a quick video that um, HCAT put together a couple years ago. And uh, we like showing it um, and keep showing it. And I've got the uh, approval of uh, the folks that run HCAT now to keep showing it. But it's important. And even if your microgrids can't support the whole community that it gets its power from at once, if you have a hospital in that area, it guarantees the hospital keeps going. If you have police and fire in the area, it makes sure they have electricity. And if there's any electricity that can be spared at night, so hopefully the communities can also share some of that 
and share a few hours of power to make sure their food stays fresh and they can do things. Microgrids are the way to go. And one of the main things that uh, HCAT is working on right now is a renewable energy microgrid for the Air Force. They're demonstrating it at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. Um, Burns and McDonald is designing it and they're gonna be building it. It's uh, been approved for construction and we're, we've just had our final program review to, to look at um, implementing it and getting it in the ground. And we're hoping that once it's in the ground and people actually can see it, touch it, and understand how it works, and see the reliability and the versatility of it. It'll make sense to a lot of folks, a lot of big electric grids and the military, and they'll see the, the benefit of being self-sustaining and resilient, all based on renewable energy microgrid. So that's gonna wrap it up for today on Stanton Energy Man, and don't forget, we're not on Fridays anymore starting next week. We're gonna be on Tuesdays, and I'll be doing next week's show directly from the Big Island at Blue Planet Research. I haven't told Paul Pontio yet, so if he's watching today, get ready, Paul. We're, we're coming to have a show on Tuesday over there. And uh, we'll be talking to you from the Big Island on Tuesday. So until then, aloha.